Hello everyone, my name is Tina and I'm going to present joint work with Diego, Dwight, Krishna, Wim and Matthias. Our first goal is to understand what our title, Containment of Simple Conjunctive Regular Path Queries, means. To do this, I will first quickly explain conjunctive regular path queries and their containment problem. Then, I will motivate and explain the simple conjunctive regular path queries and discuss our main results. Let's begin with conjunctive queries, or short CQs. I will not formally define CQs, but explain them with the following example, asking for spouses who have the same occupation. The query here is named Q and will return X and Y if they meet the following constraints. First, Y must be the spouse of X. And second, there must be some C, which is the occupation of X and the occupation of Y. We can represent this query graphically as a pattern to make it easier to understand. Here, all variables are denoted by nodes, while the relations are represented by edges and their labels. In this graphical representation, I will denote output nodes with green color. So our pattern here will output X and Y. If you now want to evaluate the query on a knowledge base, we have to check if we can match this pattern in the knowledge base. We will find this pattern here with Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown as bosses, since they both have the same occupation actor. And as this both relation is symmetric, both Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown can be the X variable, thus the query will return two outputs. In practice, CQs are often too restricted. Suppose that we want to find all types of artists in this graph. Since the lengths of the subclass paths are different, Writing a conjunctive query that finds out if an occupation is some subclass of artist is impossible. The reason is that CQs can only be query about fixed length paths, but here we have different length. Instead, one would need a union of conjunctive queries here, which might be very lengthy since we already need three CQs for this small example. Therefore, it is useful to add more expressiveness to the queries, for example, in the form of regular expressions. And this brings us to conjunctive regular path queries, or short CRPQs. We can represent CRPQs with the same graphical representation as CQs, but now the edges can be labeled with arbitrary regular expressions. This CRPQ here asks for spouses X and Y, whose occupation is a transitive subclass of artists. If we want to evaluate this query, we need to find x and y such that there is an edge labeled spouse from x to y and paths from x to artist, which are labeled occupation followed by arbitrary many subclass of edges, and the same for y. Clearly, Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown satisfy this query since the occupation actor is a subclass of artist. Furthermore, Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller also satisfy these conditions, since Arthur Miller's occupation author is also a transitive subclass of artist. Therefore, our query returns four outputs. Now that we know what CRPQs are and how to evaluate them, let's have a look at query containment. Given to queries Q1 and Q2, the query containment problem asks if, for every database, the outputs of Q1 are a subset of the outputs of Q2. This means that for every database, every answer of Q1 on the database is also returned by Q2. And if this is the case, we say that Q1 is contained in Q2. To better understand this definition, let's have a look at an example. Give a query Q1 asking for direct subclasses of artists and a query Q2 asking for transitive subclasses of artists if we want to find out whether Q1 is contained in Q2, we have to look at the outputs of Q1 on arbitrary databases. Since every direct subclass of artist is also a transitive subclass of artist, every output of Q1 will also be in the output of Q2. So Q1 is indeed contained in Q2. Why is query containment important? Well, there are many areas of application, including query optimization, knowledge base verification, and many more. Let's take a closer look at query optimization here. Query optimization attempts to determine the most efficient way to execute a given query. 
and one part in making query evaluation more efficient is to avoid evaluating redundant parts of a query. We can use query containment on different parts of a query to check whether some of these are redundant. In the example below, we clearly see that it is redundant to ask whether Ecto is a transitive subclass of artists, since the other part of the query asks us to verify that Ecto is a direct subclass of artists. Besides that, we can also use query containment checks to see if queries are equivalent. This might allow us to rewrite a large query into a smaller one, which might be easier or faster to answer. So we see that query containment is useful. So what do we know about containment of CFQs? Floresco, Levy and Suchu showed that it is in X-Space, while Calvanese, Giacomo, Lanzarini and Vardy gave a matching X-Space lower bound and extended the upper bound to two-way CFPQs. This means that the problem is decidable, yet has a high complexity. But is this the end? Not yet. Bonifati, Martens and Tim analyzed which queries users ask REST databases and came to the conclusion that most queries are very simple. To give you an impression, let's have a look at their results from Wikidata. From the 55 million regular path queries they found in their logs, more than 92% were just concatenations of single symbols and single symbols under a star. An example of this class is this query here. If we additionally allow disjunctions of single symbols and disjunctions under a star, like in this expression, then this even covers more than 99% of the regular path queries found in the logs. This motivates us to study very restricted classes of CRPQs. For example, we will study the class CRPQ of small a and small a star, by which we denote the class of CRPQs in which every edge either has a single symbol or a single symbol on the earth star, like in this CRPQ here. These CRPQs correspond to the ones that have expressions in the uppermost class in the table. And the reason is that we can always get rid of concatenations by introducing extra nodes. Similarly, we will consider the class CRPQ of single symbol and transitive closure over sets of symbols, by which we denote the class of CRPQs where only edge labels are allowed, which are single symbols, or which are transitive closure over sets of symbols. Of course, sets of symbols can also have just one element, so transitive closure over single symbols is also allowed. And by the same logic, this example query here is also in the class CAPQ of sets of symbols and transitive closure over sets of symbols. Now we've seen the simple CAPQs we consider, so let's discuss our main results. We studied the query containment problem where we restrict the classes where Q1 and Q2 come from. When we say query containment A and B, then we restrict Q1 to be from A and Q2 to be from B. Considering different classes A and B might give us a better insight into the problem and where your hardness comes from. For example, we consider the query containment of CAPQ in the class CAPQ of sets of symbols and cleaning closure over single symbols. This problem is the query containment problem where Q1 is always a CRPQ and Q2 is from the fragment CRPQ of sets of symbols and cleaning closure over single symbols. Our main results say that the containment problem becomes probably easier if the left or right query doesn't allow disjunction under transitive closures. On the other hand, if we do have disjunction under transitive closure, then containment is already exponential space hard, even for these simple classes of queries. If we compare this to the Wikidata queries, we see that the complexity drops as soon as Q1 or Q2 are in the fragment which accounts for 98.4% of all queries. Now let's have a quick look at the X-space hardness proof, which is the technically most involved proof of the paper. Both our and Calvanese at all's hardness proof use a reduction from exponential to corridor tiling problem, which is defined as follows. We give a natural number n, a set of tile types, a top right tile and a bottom left tile. And the question is if there exists a correct exponential corridor tiling. 
which means that there is a tiling where the bottom left and the top right tiles are correct. Adjacent sides on tiles have the same color and the width of the tiling is 2 to the power of n. The height of the tiling can be arbitrary. In the proof, Calvanis had all encode all possible tilings in Q1, while Q2 only encodes tilings with errors. This way, if Q1 is contained in Q2, there is no correct tiling. Checking the vertical adjacency constraints of the tiling is the most complex part and is encoded by a conjunction over disjunctions in Q2. And this conjunction over disjunctions is the reason why their expressions don't fall into our fragments. We tried very long to rewrite Q2 in a suitable form, but finally we found that we also had to rewrite Q1 to make it work. Using cycles in both Q1 and Q2, we can simulate disjunctions in a non-trivial manner. I won't go into details here, but if you are interested, you can find them in our paper. To give you an idea about what else we've done in our paper, here is a table containing the complexities of containment of various fragments. All results are completeness results. We've considered containment problems of CRPQs where one or both sides are restricted to the fragments we have identified. To say some words about the results. If each edge label is only a single symbol, then we have conjunctive queries. So there, the rather mild complexity of NP or pi to p is not surprising. As soon as there is more flexibility, for instance about the length of paths or the label of an edge, the complexity jumps to pi to p or p space. And if we allow even more flexibility in the form of transitive closure over sets of symbols, the complexity goes up to x space. Notice that all the complexities we mention here are in terms of the size of the queries. So even if some of these complexities seem to be high, they are not that bad because queries are typically small in practice. Finally, I want to conclude with some open problems. We've seen that our x space hardness proof heavily relies on a cyclic structure. So the first question is, what happens if we restrict the query shape in these fragments? And on the last slide, we showed a complete picture for symmetric containment problems or if one side is full CRPQs. But if we want to consider containment for all pairs of different classes, we have two problems which remain open. Namely, when the left side is restricted to CRPQ of single symbol and transitive closure over sets of symbols, while the right side is either CRPQ of sets of symbols or CRPQ of single symbols and transitive closure over single symbols. This concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention.